Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and brightest from the world of business, marketing, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Folks, this is the first show that I'm recording with somebody in Greece. He's not Greek. He's Israeli. We'll get to that in a little bit. But my guest, Gal Mog, is a veteran entrepreneur who spent the last 20 years disrupting the recruitment industry. And his previous company, Pando Logic, a world leader in recruitment advertising tech, and as an ex-major of the Israeli Special Forces, Gal loves a strong challenge. Inventing ideas and turning them into world-changing products is of particular interest to him, and his career clearly exemplifies. We'll get into that. We'll break it down. And he spent many years creating cutting-edge project products in the recruitment industry, and most recently with Tel- Telenia. Did I say that right? Telenia? Yes. Telenia. And together with Daron Siegel, he found Telenia in 2017 with a vision of changing the antiquated methods of talent sourcing. Super relevant. And today, Telenia works with leading companies around the world, enabling their recruiting teams to find and engage with three times more qualified and diversified talent than any tool on the market. It's a big statement. We'll get to that. And he's an author, having written three books, as well as an avid musician who enjoys writing music, lyrics, and performing. I don't think we're going to get him to sing. I mean, he is at a restaurant in Greece. I don't know if he had too much to drink yet, but we'll get to that. But he keeps a full plate, has tons of interest worth diving into, and we'll get to that. Gal, welcome to the podcast, my man. Thank you, Adam. Pleasure to be here. And, you know, this is uh, I'd like to have that introduction in writing so I can take it to my mother. Uh, You could you could have it. I will record it. I will pack it up. You could use it. You could use it any way you want. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, You know, halfway around the world, we connected uh, about a month and a half ago uh, and a tremendous conversation. I said, you know what? We need to take this onto the podcast and, and talk more. So before we get to the entrepreneur stuff, before we get to the company stuff, before we get to building businesses, I want to talk about your life and career for a little bit. Um, how old were you when you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you started in the army in Israel? Is it 17? What, what age did they start there? 18. And uh, typically it's three years. I stayed for seven years. I became and an officer. You, you did, and you worked your way up the ranks, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, what, what was the scariest part about joining the army? Uh, the scariest part was, you know, I joined special forces and they take 5,000 kids and uh, about 15 end up uh, the uh, training course of uh, two years. So the scary part was not the battles, the combat and things like that. It's the scary part where they, they dump you and they throw you out of the unit. And I managed to, to sustain that. What would you say was your biggest learning from your time in the, in the Israeli army? Not like not the physical stuff, but what like that mental fortitude, you know, what did that teach you? What was that big takeaway that, you know, when you started in the business world, you look back on that time in the army and you said, thank God, thank God, you know, I, I had that experience because it made me so much stronger. Absolutely. So uh, it taught me about, you know, working in high uh, uncertainty conditions, uh, making decisions. Uh, you know, these were decisions that people's life were dependent on, not like business, but it was uh, challenging. It takes you to the edge. At the ed- age of 23, I led uh, teams of uh, special forces uh, um, soldiers beyond enemy lands, you know, uh, hundreds of kilometers away from Israel, where our odds of coming back were very small. So that taught me that uh, setting missions, goals, and challenges is probably the best way to, to spend your life. I love it. And I, 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 I'm a big fan of the show Fauda. How, how true to life is that show? Which show? Fauda. 
a powder. Yes, it's it's good. You know, it's uh, pretty close to reality. That that's why I like saying the name Daron. That's a, the lead character in the show there, but uh, exactly, it's very <laughs> but popular. We'll, but we'll we'll move we'll move on to that one. So let's dig into the career a little bit. Um, so you left the military. What was the first step into you know civilian business life when you left the military? What was your plan? What were you thinking about? What'd you do? Yeah, I wanted to get my MBA. First of all, I got my bachelor's degree in Israel, and then I wanted to get my MBA in the United States. I ended up at the University of Maryland, and I worked. Uh, my way through uh, school, working at the Israeli embassy in Washington and, you know, working for the government in economic and financial related matter. That was a very, very good school where I was exposed for the first time to uh, the American economy, business and overall life in America. And I fell in love. Yeah, I know. Absolutely, too. And, you know, your career has a, compl- a fantastic and fascinating background, literally spanning military, politics, business. You're, you're a writer and so much more. And it's intriguing for me to speak to someone with so much experience there. What, what do you think enables you to be able to, you know, pivot in between each one of these disciplines so smoothly? So nothing in uh, my upbringing that can indicate that I will end up being uh, a business person, let alone entrepreneur. My father was a military, you know, Navy person. My mother was a teacher. And I thought I would end up in the military just like my dad, who ended up, you know, heading the Israeli Navy. Uh, But uh, I just uh, was exposed at that time, uh, long before they knew how to spell startup, to entrepreneurial uh, management and initiatives. And that really caught my uh, excitement and attention. And it's all about creativity. You know, you create new things. That's the same uh, when you, uh, you know, compose and write new songs, when you create products and ideas and create businesses. And also about getting other people excited about your ideas and getting them to invest in you and follow you and help you achieve your goals. So I think there's a common theme around my career, which is going to the edge and uh, putting your destiny in your own hands and trying to achieve the impossible. Oh, I love it. That's such a that's such a powerful statement. And I want to rewind to the early stage in your career before we get to the, the recruitment, because it's always interesting how people get into get into recruitment. But you were the second highest ranking diplomat at the Israeli embassy in, in, in Washington, DC, correct? And you handled yeah. economic and trade? Yeah, I was second ranking the economic section and not not in the entire embassy. And and how did how did that opportunity come about? Was it just a logical progression from the military? No, not at all. You know, I wanted to uh, to have a way to fund my uh, MBA study at the University of Maryland, and there were not a lot of opportunities in Washington for, you know, Israelis without a work permit. Right. So I just uh, identified who heads the Department of Economic Affairs, and I approached him directly, and I said, I'm your best choice. And it turned out he was looking for someone right at that time, and I was able to get uh, the job, which was amazing. That's fantastic. So let's pivot into the topic du jour of recruitment. You know, you've built businesses, you've built technology, you're always up for a challenge, but why the recruitment industry? What was it about it that said to you, there's something broken here, there's an opportunity, there's a better way to do this? What was it that said we could create and should create something in this industry? Right. So um, I started my entrepreneurial career not in recruitment. I was in different uh, areas of high tech and started companies uh, before I got into recruitment. But my wife was a recruiter. And I saw the challenges that she was facing in looking at so many resumes, uh, not being able to uh, get to speak with people and qualify them properly because of the administrative uh, you know, overhead around that. And she actually asked me to help her. And I looked at what she was doing and I said, there must be a better solution. And I looked around. And I found, you know, things that were not very impressive. They were a copy of the old newspaper model, you know, just online. Like a classified ad. Like classified ad. And I said, there must be something better. And since I didn't find anything, I started a company. And that was Pandalogic, my first, uh, it wasn't my first company, my first recruitment company. So we're talking about, you know, what was it, you know, that you saw in the recruitment industry that needed to be changed? You spoke about, you know, everything was looking antiquated from a classified ad perspective, and there was a better way to source candidates, right? Right. So I had that idea that you would be able to source from the entire internet as opposed to, you know, post a job on one site 
and get a limited amount of traffic. And I also identified a very big uh, challenge of the newspaper industry that, you know, the classified ads in print was dying and they were looking for ways to, uh, to replace that with online. But each individual newspaper site was very, very limited. So right. I had that idea to create a network of job sites uh, and campaign and ad across many, many sites to deliver a lot more traffic and do it in a more um, qualified way, you know, by doing matching and things like that, which was, you know, very early in, in those days to do things like that. And now, fortunately, that company, Pandologic, had turned into the world uh, biggest uh, company as far as uh, recruitment advertising technology, and it uh, has over a thousand job sites in That's the amazing. United States where it campaigns its ads. It's a mature company now. That's amazing. And congratulations on that. And just to level set everybody, what, what year was that? What was the time frame when Panda Logic hit the market? So Panda Logic uh, hit the market in 2007. Right. So we're still talking relatively, you know, early days of LinkedIn. LinkedIn was 2005 around that time. Yes. So, you know, when, when you know, I mean, listen, when anyone, anyone thinks about jobs, they think about LinkedIn, they think about Indeed, they think about Monster and all those sites, too. What are, you, what are your thoughts on LinkedIn? You know, generally speaking, from a job seeker and a, and a candidate sourcing perspective. So, you know, we all admire LinkedIn and I think it's an amazing company. It's done miracles to the recruitment industry, uh, putting all resumes online and making them accessible to everyone. This is a true democratization of talent. I still remember the old days when we uh, had resumes in our database and recruitment agencies had, you know, an advantage by having as many resumes and we were right. sending resume via mail. So it did a very, very good thing for the recruitment industry. But over the years, uh, you know, it became apparent to me, and this is also one of the reasons why I started Talenia, that uh, it is not the most e efficient way to source talent. You know, 99% no, of the companies do that. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, you know, right for the time, still right for many, many reasons. But it was limited. And I can explain, you know, in more length why it was yeah, limited. And I, and I do want to get into that. I mean, when, when we think about it, listen, I'm a recruiter. It's my trade. Um, I mean, I use LinkedIn for 90 percent of my recruiting needs because that's what's out there. And that's where my candidates are. And that's how I can access them. I change my ways in recruiting, not always relying on all the functionality of LinkedIn. I found other technologies and other pieces as well where I could connect with candidates in a more efficient, effective way. Let's talk about how Talenia is different. Let's talk about, let, let's back it up though. Let's talk about where you saw those opportunities to be different. Because I really truly believe in differentiation. That's a key to, to what makes products successful. How are you right. different than everything else out there? And not just be different for the sake of being different, Gal, but being different because it's better and more effective. And maybe not always better, but maybe another option or uh, it's a different tool for a different type of recruiter. Okay. so. Um... I think everyone who listens to uh, your show would agree that recruitment is probably the last standing industry where people sit by computers, enter keywords, and then sift through profiles. And I thought that was silly, to be honest with you. Uh, but there was no alternative. Even new products like uh, Hartual, Seekout, and Tello, who claim to search beyond LinkedIn, right. are doing the same thing, Boolean keyword search. Of course. And Boolean keyword search uh, has many, many limitations. It is not finding talent. It is finding people who happen to have the right keywords on their profile. It's highly discriminatory. Exactly. Uh, you know, women tend to put less skills. Minority tend to describe themselves differently than, you know, uh, white male uh, and, and things like that. So I wanted to create a company that would allow recruiters to source candidates in a whole new way on multiple sources, not just LinkedIn, but many, many other sources where uh, talent live uh, digital fingerprints and do it using AI and not Boolean search and make it equitable so people will not be discriminated just because they write their profile one way or the other. And it's not only the best sourcing solution in the market, it's also the best solution to, uh, to find and recruit uh, diverse talent, and uh, we've created some amazing thing using AI that allow you not only to find diverse talent, but also to increase three, four, five times 
the number of diverse talent in your pool. That's tremendous, and it's more relevant now than ever in this world that we live in. And without giving away all the proprietary secret sauce behind it, I mean, what are those other sources, and, and what are the contact methods? I mean, listen, no it's, one's going to know your algorithm. You're not giving away. No, this guy no, is no. Israeli Special Forces. He knows how to keep a secret or two. Listen, I don't know myself my algorithm because I don't write them. I only sell them. So um, <laughs> um, we basically search the Internet. We search Google. And people leave digital fingerprints on many places. You know, public pages of LinkedIn is one of the sources. But, you right. know, other sources like GitHub, Stake Overflow, uh, you know, Meetups uh, have public pages which are accessible because they all want Google to index them. So that's what we say. We also have our own database of 900 million profiles. That's more wow. than LinkedIn. LinkedIn wow. is 680, I 600, believe. Yeah. And uh, we search everywhere and we search in real time. So we make sure that we bring fresh information and not information from six months ago, which could be completely irrelevant. Right. For People now. change jobs. They don't update LinkedIn. They, they started something new. You have no idea. It's not up to date. Yes, but there's another limitation to uh, data, which is people don't tend to update their profile very uh, often. Right. So you end up missing people who happen to have a skill that I didn't mention on the profile. And we were able to overcome that challenge by uh, developing technology, AI-based technology that can predict skills that people have and fail to put on the profile. And we, we uh, help people you know like women and minorities who tend to put less skills on the profile by using artificial intelligence to add those skills to the profile so they get a, a fair chance to be considered i love it that's fantastic now gal are there specific industries that your tool works best within like maybe tech uh or anything else or is it completely agnostic to industry no it's agnostic but you know it's primarily for skilled workers so because if you don't have skills then you know you're equal to to uh, other people without skills. So I would say it's mostly skill work. It could be healthcare, it can be sales, it can be finance, it can be tech. And I assume this is a global product, or are there certain regions where this product work, works best? No, it's completely uh, <clears throat> global. What is the biggest challenge that you faced when you were starting this company? It, it is uh, a very very complex technology and the biggest challenge is to make it easy for users to use and that's the basis of our AI so we train the software to think like a recorder and automate and optimize many of the functions they recorded do on a daily basis but they don't have access to the amount and the quality of the data we have and even if they had they don't have the processing capacity in their brains to do that, let me give you an example. Okay, uh, we have uh, a diversity boosting uh, product that can increase diversity participation in your hiring pipeline by, you know, three hundred percent, five hundred percent, and uh, <clears throat> we are able not only to identify diverse talent, but also identify differences in the way they describe themselves, and we recommend to the user small minute changes in the search that would yield a, a much greater participation of diverse talent in their pool this is something that people don't have access to they don't know where you know minorities right. um, uh, go to school how they write themselves what skills they have what association they're associated with we know and then we can run thousands of thousands of permutations of different searches and come up with the optimal search variation for uh, the highest representation of diverse talent. This is something that is beyond human capacity oh, and wow. only AI is able to overcome not only the uh, intrinsic uh, bias, but also the inability to process uh, that amount of data. And I think that's Incredible. the biggest, the biggest uh, benefit that we bring to the market, our That's ability to make our software, you know, equitable to all talent and at least allow them to be considered and not give them any preferential treatment just by making their profiles available to recruiters in a way that are unable to, 
to uh, to present themselves with the and, traditional tools. And that's and that's tremendous. I mean, there there's not much like this out there for your sales team. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like a slam dunk. It sounds like it's an easy sell. But what challenges and what you know what kind of pushback are they facing when you go to market and you try to sell this? Uh, yes, our biggest challenge in that respect is the fact that people are used to Boolean search. They've mastered Boolean search for years. They take pride in their ability to uh, do Boolean search. Uh, and now a company comes to them with AI that can do most of the search uh, automatically and do it in a better way that they can do it themselves. And the only thing we want them to do a thumbs up or thumbs down candidates and the software would learn from your feedback which candidate you want and which candidate you do not want. Technologically, it's a big, big uh, challenge. But psychologically, for recruiters, it's also uh, a psychological challenge of changing the way they operate. And we, we face that you know challenge when not VPs for talent acquisition, not chief diversity officers who understand they need to go in a way of AI, but line recruiters who said, yeah, you know, what's going to be off me, you know, if I use that kind of technology. But once they're exposed, they never want to go back to a Boolean search. No, I love it. And you got it's the old expression, right? You can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you can. And I think it's the evolution and recruiting. I mean, honestly, when you look at all the all the growth and the innovation in so many different industries, recruiting, there, there's some companies that are, are way advanced, like yourself and a, and a couple others that I know. But for the most part, Recruiting is the same as it's been. You know, it's gone from paper to fax machines to the computers to the LinkedIn, and but it's still the same searches. It's still the same process. And now's the time, especially with the diversity piece, for us to make a change as an industry in a whole. And I applaud you for that. Thank you. And you know, just think about if you had to search on Google by entering keywords, as opposed to writing. You know, this is what I'm looking for. Context. Google uh, understand what you're looking for and, and bring things within the right context. That's recruitment is way behind in this. It's a very simple process that everyone can learn. You know, enter keyword, delete keyword, see what comes out. Oh, it's not but, that hard. You know, re- recruiters deserve a lot more than that. Yeah, that's tremendous. And and I'm I'm excited to take this for a spin and, and check out the demo. And anybody listening to the show, we'll link it up when we when we air it. You guys can check it all out. We'll find out more about that. I want to talk about qualities that make a good entrepreneur. Do you believe that an entrepreneur is born? An entrepreneur, or is it something that you can learn and to, to be? I think it's a, it's a combination. I mean, people who are born entrepreneurs are likely to, you know, have an easy path to success, and people who have to teach themselves to be entrepreneurs. It's the ability to take challenges and overcome fear and anxieties. I think that's the most important thing. And you know, my career in the military taught me a lesson in that. But also, I think uh, people lose uh, because they're not persistent enough in their attempts. Because there's no company that starts with one way and uh, end up ended up in in the same way. I, I looked uh, just recently at the initial uh, investment deck of Uber. Okay, and you would think that the amazing entrepreneurs of Uber had that all figured out from the beginning. You no. Know, they had a limousine car service. Yeah, it was black cars. Francisco. Yeah, black cars. And they ran into, you know, some challenges and opportunities and were agile enough to say, oh, wow, that's a bigger opportunity. Uh, you know, it happened to us as well. And uh, if you are persistent, resilient, and you're willing to sustain, you know, what it takes, you know, personal toll, financial toll, and all of that, you're going to be successful, even if you are not born an entrepreneur. I wasn't born into an entrepreneurial family. You know, my, my father was a military person, but you know, I grew into that. Yeah, absolutely. My, both my parents were teachers. My brother's a teacher and somehow, somehow I, I fell into this world of, of, you know, running and building my own business and it's incredible. So shifting gears and I, and I greatly appreciate all of your insight into entrepreneurship and building a business, especially in the recruitment industry, but let's shift to music. How old are you when you started playing and creating music? Were you, were you, how young were you? Probably 12. And what was your first instrument? Um, I think it was a flute, but I hated it. And my <laughs> mother was very smart to tell me, you know, you pick any any instrument you want. And then I moved to accordion 
and I hated that as well. And then she said, okay, why don't you try uh, guitar? And I liked it, but I didn't like to practice. So she brought the teacher to our house and my brother played as well. And we played together. She was like, you know, she's the teacher and she was a genius in getting us. We all play, we're all musicians and it's all thanks to our mother. And what kind of music do you really enjoy playing? What style of guitar? I like jazz. And I play jazz. I play, you know, together with my wife, who's a pianist. And I always wrote lyrics. But only in recent years, I started to also write music. And I enjoy it tremendously. I, I have my own band of nine musicians. Oh, wow. And, I, you know, I, I do like to perform, sing, and play. I love it. And, and what musicians have inspired you in your life? Uh, you, you're giving me a hard question here. That should be so, easy for any musician, man. Yes. Yes. So uh, a lot of Israeli music, you know, your audience would not recognize, but I would say, you know, um, Ella Please. Fitzgerald, Stevie Wonder, uh, uh, and, 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 and a lot of jazz musicians. I love it. That's that's fantastic. And I want to I want to talk about the, the, the personal side, the motivational side of, of Gal over here. When, when I when I say the word authentic, when I say that word authentic, what does that mean to you? truth it means that you know in order to be successful and lead people you need to be absolutely authentic uh people may buy bullshit from you uh for a short period and then uh once you're exposed you you you, you're losing your credibility so i think it's extremely important to be authentic when you are entrepreneur and leading people and also vis-a-vis investors you have to always tell the truth and what is what is the greatest piece of advice gal that you've ever received that you take action on every single day of your life it could be professional it could be personal you know what is that mantra what is that that advice that you've heard at some point in your life that every day you repeat and take action on yeah my dad told me life is um uh a journey of friction you go in a tunnel and there's friction, you know, from both sides of the tunnel and you need to plug along, you know, continue and push and push and push uh, and never give up. So that was probably the best uh, advice I've received. And every time I see a challenge, a difficulty, I tell to myself, you know, when you look back, you know, three, five years from now at that challenge, you'll be proud of yourself that you were able to overcome that and not, uh, you know, stop or lose or, or be despaired. And that's a very, very helpful um, psychological uh, state for entrepreneurs because they face so many challenges, running out of money, technological uh, difficulties and things like that that are, can easily despair you. But, you know, if you look at it as part of your journey, uh, and I always tell to my uh, employees, if it was easy, everyone would have done that. It's right. difficult. That's why, you know, we're there to to do it where everyone else has failed. And we are, you know, in a blue ocean as far as our technology, in our diversity a solution, in our AI search. There's not really any other company in the market that can do the same thing that we do. That may be in the future. So we need to... Uh, to push uh, forward as, as, ma- as quickly as possible. But uh, if it wasn't uh, difficult, you know, there would be uh, many, Everybody many companies doing, doing the same. I love it. Exactly. Such, such great, you know, words of wisdom and advice. And I appreciate it. And Gal, last but not least, you've had a tremendous life and career growing up in Israel, serving the country, moving into business, entrepreneurship, and creating a piece of technology that could really change not just the industry, but change people's lives. And, and I applaud you for that. And you've been through a lot. You've been through the good. You've been through the bad. You've probably been in situations that no human being could even understand. And in those dark times and in those rough times, you had to pull yourself up and you had to harness that tenacity. And in the same breath right now, you're talking to me in Greece from a restaurant on the beach with your family there, safe and sound. And you want to show gratitude. Galamo, what is your North Star? Always remember the important things. So even if you are in the middle of a crisis and dark days and, you know, looming uh, around you, uh, just remember what's important. It's, it's your family, it's your values, 
it's your health and love and if they are okay you're gonna sustain i love it man gal thank you for spending some time with us today i greatly appreciate it where could folks find out more about you where could they find out more about telenia where could they connect yeah they can they, everyone is welcome to uh to contact us you know just go to our site www.telenia with a y dot com um and uh we offer everyone a free trial of our software so they don't have to take our word for it they can try it compare it to other tools that they use uh see how we do as far as getting diversified talent into their hiring pipeline and see if they like it i love it gal thank you so much thank you adam and everybody who has spent some time with us today i hope you i hope you had a few takeaways I hope you learned a thing or two and please definitely check out golf definitely check out the company it's awesome i know i am going to do that and you know where to find us you know where to find more www.thepodcast.com if you like the show please leave a rating and review it really helps us get exposure to so many more people who need to hear about the podcast the podcast you know where to find us on social remember take care of each other wash your hands stay six feet apart and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast to join the conversation search the podcast on linkedin and to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.